Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, my name is John Donvan. I want to thank you for coming to this program. Uh, we're starting a tiny bit early because we wanted to talk with you about how this program differs from the other events that um, are taking place at the Aspen Ideas Festival. And in general, it's a little bit different in that um, this is not a talk or an interview. It's actually a debate. Uh, we're going to have two uh, debaters come on stage and take on the question of whether we should erase bad memories. Um, we do that under the auspices of our title, Open to Debate. It's a program that's been around since 2006. We travel around the country, also put out a podcast or a YouTube channel. On a weekly basis, we create a debate on, on relevant topics of various sorts uh, with two goals in mind. One is to talk about the actual substance, which we'll do today. We'll talk a little bit about the science of this, behind this very question of whether we should erase bad memories. But we also have the secondary goal, actually, no, it's a primary goal, of wanting to make the point that we can, as a society, disagree with each other. We can argue with each other in ways that are constructive and civil. And what we're really hoping for, and I think you're going to see, is a demonstration of that, because our two debaters are quite a, a good deal in disagreement on the question of whether we should be doing this just because we can but they're going to be making their best cases, and they're also going to be listening um, to each other. Uh, to that end, I want to ask you now to just think about it, uh, even if you're not quite uh, up to speed with the, with the science behind it, just decide for yourself whether your answer to that question would be a yes or a no, because at the end of the program, I want to ask you about uh, that very question again and see where you stand. We, we have found our data shows that uh, after our debates, 35% of the audience changes its mind, which we think is a really good indicator of the fact that people are really, really listening to the arguments with an open mind and hitting that word that we emphasize in our title, open. We want you to be open to debate and open to listening, and we appreciate that our debaters are opening to sharing a stage with one another. So that's our mission and that's our goal. One other thing is that we very much like to have you participate in the debate. So after we've been talking for a while, I'll come to you for questions. Uh, and we really, really welcome questions. Uh, to move the conversation along into new places. I just have a kind of a strict rule that um, I really need you to ask a question. Um, <laughs> and so don't debate with the debaters. And I know there's a temptation to tell a little story before your question. I want to ask you to consider whether your question would work without the story. And if you do have to have a story, if you could do it in about a 10 seconds, 15 seconds, you know, just, just think that through. So what I like to say is that um, uh, if whatever comes out of your mouth has, naturally has a question mark living at the end of it, then you totally nailed it. That's, that's a question. The last thing is, um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, uh, this, this debate will live on forever um, on our website uh, as a, the sound of it will as a podcast and also as a radio broadcast. And for that reason, and the fact that we're here at the Aspen Ideas Festival, we want our audience listening in the future to know that this was happening and that you are all here. So we welcome your applause if you hear something that you like. And I'm going to actually ask for your applause from time to time for a little bit of a touch of atmospherics. For example, when I welcome our debaters to the stage, it would be great if you could give them a round of applause. But before we go on, as I said, we're so delighted that we're at the Aspen Ideas Festival. It's not our first time, but it's the first time we're here actually doing three debates, which is pretty miraculous. And we would love to uh, invite uh, Trisha Johnson up, our partner at Aspen, just to take a couple of minutes to talk about our being here. And, and, hi, Trisha. That's one of those and one of those. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so to the point that I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, it's different. It's not a talk or panel discussion or conversation. It's two people arguing. What, what was for you the value of having that kind of presentation here at the Ideas Festival? Well, first of all, I think what Open to Debate, debate, open to debate brings, along with your team who's been incredible to work with, is the structure of a debate. And I think in order to be an effective debater, you have to also be an effective listener. Right. And we really value that. Um, and the Aspen Institute was founded on the idea of civil discourse and being able to talk to one another and think deeply. So I think part of that is also listening deeply. And, and you know, we, we all know that the state of discourse is broken in the country and, and there's sort of an, a sense that we're arguing too much. And yet here we are, we're going to argue. Um, but what makes it different? In, in what way does it doing it this way actually kind of be, uh, work maybe not as an antidote, to the state of discourse, but contribute in a positive way. I think because there are a little, uh, there are a few rules of the game, right? Yeah. And you can't also 
debate without having a firm grasp of data or whatever does it makes your logic, logic what makes your well. debate strong. Yeah. So I think that all contributes to opening each other's minds to different points of view. Right. And what we like to see the debaters do, number one, is no personal attacks, which I don't expect in this case anyway, but also um, actually to address the points that the other side is making, as you say, to really listen. So let's see how we do. Again, we're really delighted to be here. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so as we get started, uh, we just want to give you a little bit of uh, background on the topic that we're going to be discussing. A technology called decoded neurofeedback may soon allow us to erase bad memories. Proponents say the ability to erase painful memories could provide immense relief and healing for those who have experienced trauma, allowing them to regain control of their lives. On the other hand, memories shape our identity. Creativity, personal development, and achievement are often inspired by great pain. Further, who decides which memories can be erased? Against this backdrop, we debate, should we erase bad memories? All right, now let's please welcome our debaters to the stage. Uh, as I said, we're going to have one debater answering yes to the question, should we erase bad memories, and one answering no. Let's meet the debater who's answering yes, the author of The Battle for Your Brain, Defending the Right to Think Freely in an Age of Neurotechnology, Duke University professor, director of the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, Nita Farahani. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. And arguing no, that we should not erase bad memories, senior reporter for Vox Future Perfect and co-host of the Future Perfect podcast, Sigal Samuel. I, I understand that the two of you have, you're, you're well acquainted. I read an interview that, uh, that you did with Nita So, and it, and it seemed to me that it was quite civil and friendly. So I think, <laughs> I think that I that's- I hope so, yeah. I hope so. I found the, the conversation to actually be incredibly inspiring and thought provoking. So I'm delighted to meet up again in this context. Me too, I'm still thinking about that conversation. Thanks. All right, well now we're gonna have another one and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so uh, what, what we do is we go in structured rounds We'll have a round of opening statements, then we'll have a discussion <laughs> section, then we'll have a round of closing statements. So we're going to move on to our first round, uh, opening statements. Each of the debaters has five minutes to make the case for yes or no. Anita, you are up first. The floor is yours. You are answering yes once again to the question, should we erase bad memories? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you to argue the question in the affirmative of should we erase bad memories? Um, I want to offer a subtle reframing as a way forward for the conversation. Instead of should we erase bad memories, I think the question is should you have the right to erase bad memories if you choose to do so? In other words, do we have the right to choose whether and if so we want to endure bad memories or how we wish to move through those experiences in life? Um, are we in the driver's seat? of our own mental anguish, or are we subject to the whims of fate, destined to suffer whatever befalls us without actually having a choice in the matter? I believe that we should be in the driver's seat of making choices about our own brains and mental experiences. Um, as an advocate for what I call a right to cognitive liberty, which we'll be talking about in the debate today, I argue that we should have a right to be able to modulate, to change our own thoughts, memories, emotions, and to, argue, and to argue otherwise undermines our human dignity, human agency, and the right to set the course for our own lives. In our debate today, I will talk about some of the tools and techniques, including decoded neurofeedback, which you saw uh, a little spot on, that our advances in neuroscience and neurotechnology that enable us to be able to change our memories and to change our memories in ways that can improve our lives and our well-being can enable human flourishing by setting the course and setting the path for our own lives. I'm not here to argue that you should erase your memories. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to argue that you should erase all of your memories. Rather, I'm here to argue that you are in the best position to make that choice, that you are the one who gets to decide on what terms and under what circumstances you endure your own suffering. For me, that has included overriding bad memories when they were more suffering than I could endure, more suffering than I would choose to endure, and more suffering than any person has a right to tell me that I must endure. 
I want that choice for me. And I want that choice for you as well. My esteemed opponent today may argue that erasing bad memories is unethical or that it's dangerous, or that it in interferes with the natural process of life and transcendence, or that it undermines the authenticity of our lived experiences and deprives us of the valuable lessons and motivations that come from adversity. I believe that these arguments are based on false assumptions, that they're based on outdated views and paternalistic judgments about how we should live our own lives. They also assume that memory is fixed and accurate, that it's an accurate recording of the past and what we've experienced, when in fact it's dynamic. It's a reconstructive process that's constantly influenced by our present emotions, our present experiences. They assume that our natural state of being is preferable to an enhanced state, when in fact nature is often cruel unfair and utterly arbitrary in the types of experiences that we endure, and that we've always sought to find ways to transcend the limitations that we experience through science, through, science, through technology, through other opportunities. More troubling, I think these arguments are based on the idea that other people know better than we do whether or not we can make choices to erase our own memories, that it assumes that there is some set of regulations and decisions that can be imposed on how you choose to experience your own mental well-being. Erasing bad memories isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. It's a personal choice that should be made with informed consent, with guidance from other people and ethical safeguards. It's a choice that should be respected and supported rather than condemned or prohibited. Erasing bad memories can offer a pathway to psychological well-being and emotional healing for people like me, who've suffered a great loss in life and who've sought to find ways to move forward by cultivating and co-creating what my experience and my endurance would be. Erasing bad memories can also offer a path of personal growth and development for people who want to overcome their fears, for their insecurities, who want to be able to cultivate their identity. It's not the same as erasing our past. It means creating ourselves. It means taking charge of our minds, our lives, and our future. It means exercising our cognitive liberty, our right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tigal, your answer to the question is no. You're saying we should not erase bad memories, and the floor is yours mm -hmm. for your five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you all for being here. Um, I'm here to argue that no, we should not erase bad memories. And I just want to make clear from the start, I'm arguing that by and large, we should not erase bad memories. I could envision there might be some exceptions to that, but generally I do not think that this is something that we should routinely pursue. And I'm going to make three arguments for this. They're actually somewhat different than what Nita was um, suggesting they would be. Um, the first one is that, yes, suffering plays an important role in human life, both for us as individuals and for society. Uh, if you've ever, you know, if you think back to an experience of deep suffering you've had or a difficult experience, you might remember how that uh, perhaps has built more compassion in you um, for others and for their suffering. Suffering also builds confidence in our own resilience. You know, if you go through a really painful breakup or a divorce or a loss, uh, and it's really, really difficult, it sucks, okay? It's just horrible. But then the next time life throws you something like that, you have a little bit more confidence in your ability to get through it. You say to yourself, I made it through last time, I can probably make it through this as well. And I think a lot of us have heard the term PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. I think fewer people have heard of its flip side, which is post-traumatic growth. Um, and there's a lot of science about this, about what a powerful phenomenon this is, and some incredible exemplars of this, which I hope to get to. Um, but the basic idea is that sometimes people can emerge on the other side of a traumatic experience stronger with new capacities, whether it's for compassion or uh, something else, new insights, and they're in some way, they feel like they're in some way better than they were before the traumatic event. So I worry that with this kind of technology, we may be cheating ourselves out of an opportunity for post-traumatic growth. And on a societal level, 
if we erase individual suffering or bad memories, what happens to the struggle to address the root cause of the suffering, which is often societal or systemic? You know, most ardent activists are, oftentimes the most ardent activists are those who've experienced something tragic. They've personally experienced it. Just think about school shootings, for example, and how many of the most vocal uh, you know, advocates uh, for gun control are people who've been touched by it personally, whether they're parents or classmates. The second argument I want to make today is that this technology has a huge potential not only for abuse, but for unintended consequences. In fact, I don't think that it's possible to have truly informed consent for this procedure. If you were to bring into this room right now all of the most brilliant neuroscientists in the world, I still doubt whether they would be able to tell you, whether they would be able to understand what all the potential ramifications of erasing your bad memories would be. We often think of memories as something that has to do with the past, past experiences, but memories are really constitutive of our present. When I think about myself as a self today, I'm largely just thinking about you know, well, that is a function of who was I yesterday, 10 years ago, in childhood, all my experiences. If you erase some of that memory, I worry that you might interfere with a sense of personal identity or, you know, our sense of psychological continuity over time. And finally, my third argument is that this kind of erasure can lead to the loss of core human capacities or values, like the capacity for unconditional love or solidarity. If we kind of lean into this push, which is very common nowadays in the age of the technofix, to make humans perfectible, to sort of achieve mastery or dominion over our nature and our experiences, and kind of tailor our experiences a la carte, what happens to people who actually don't want to erase their painful memories? They're coming to you for some other kind of social support or patients or help with their mental health. And now society says to them, no, don't bother me with your complaints and your needs. There is a clinic down the road that can take care of that for you. Just go avail yourself of the techno fix and stop bothering me. I worry there could be an implicit coercion that uh, starts befalling people, which is all of us really, who eventually have very painful memories, um, when the world becomes less and less patient with our human foibles and the difficulties in our experience. So looking forward to discussing all of this with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So we now move into a discussion session and I want to just share what, where I see the dividing lines on the argument being. So uh, Nita started out by saying that she, she uh, sees an important aspect of this being the question of whether you should have the right. Uh, a good deal of her opening statement talked about having that right. Uh, and. Uh, the right actually to avoid suffering is not a choice that to accept suffering should not necessarily have to be a choice that an individual should have to make if there's an option not to. That this uh, technology by removing the pain of bad memories can lead to emotional healing, can be a path to conquering fears. Um, and um, that not er not to, to not erase uh, means to just accept a pain that doesn't necessarily have to be there. Um, on the other side, we're hearing um, uh, Seagal arguing that just because we can doesn't necessarily mean that she, we should. Uh, she talked about if we erase bad memories, we could lose sight of the cause of, that, of the pain, and that knowing the cause of the pain in itself can be important. She said that uh, suffering itself is an important part of life, that out of it comes growth and discovery and wisdom. Um, and she also worries about some policy issues. Can we really have informed consent? And uh, ultimately, what happens if uh, the power dynamic shifts somehow and other people are making the decisions, even if it's through social pressure about who should or should not erase their memories? So we're going to talk about all of that. But I wanted to just spend, we don't often do this, but just two or three minutes talking about what this technology is. Would that be helpful to everybody? You, so, yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So that we have a picture of it. So I, I think the technology we want to talk about is called decoded neurofeedback. And um, I. When I hear a, a, a term like that that's alien to me, I say it to myself three times and it gets more and more familiar and <laughs> it, it doesn't become so much of an obstacle to understanding. So I just want to suggest we all say together, decoded neurofeedback. <laughs> One, two, three. Decoded, decoded neurofeedback. Second time. 
Decoded neurofeedback. Third time. Decoded neurofeedback. Okay, so now we all know we're talking about decoded neurofeedback. <laughs> what is it? Um, uh, would you like to take sure. that first? Yeah, yeah. and you can join in it. as well, please. Um, so first I will say that there are other technologies yes. on the table, and I want to put the kind of spectrum that are on the table. So decoded neurofeedback is a way of being able to trace specific neural activation patterns when you have a particularly painful memory. So you could uh, imagine a person being in a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, or it could be through implanted electrodes or other types of technology that would say, like, remember the most painful memory that you have, and then trace the specific neural pathways that are firing when that painful experience is something that you're recalling. Then, um, through a series of basically games, you implicitly reactivate those same neural pathways, but retrain those pathways on positive associations instead of negative associations. In general, it's not erasing the semantic content, meaning the literal facts of what happened. It's disassociating and disaggregating the fear, the emotional content from the memory itself. Memory has different components. There are emotional aspects to the memory. There are the literal, like what happened to the memory. And decoded neurofeedback largely is helping you to disassociate the fear uh, that's associated with it or to literally overwrite when that pathway fires and is reactivated involuntarily, like in PTSD, it now is associated with something positive that you were playing instead. There are drugs like propanolol, which have been trialed for a long time to try to reconsolidate memories. Every time you remember something and it gets reconsolidated into long-term memory, it changes a little bit, and you can change your association of the contents through drugs that disaggregate it. Um, there are other techniques that people have talked about. There's nothing quite like the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind of literally mapping every uh, memory and then erasing it in its entirety so that you wake up one day and don't remember a person. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. And not, I, ever, I, not ever? Um, I, I, think, I think not ever quite in the way that the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind in, in, yeah. envisioned it, but it does literally activate and then make it unstable, change it, and overwrite aspects of it. So it changes it, and then it becomes less stable and degrades over time, like many memories do, rather than having the strength that enables its recall. That's and the way in which it actually gets erased over time, is that it, memories degrade over time. And, and Sigai, just the, we're, we're most of us now familiar with the term biofeedback. Mm -hmm. you, you look at a, <clears throat> your pulse uh, pounding along, and you know that you can relax and see your heart slow down, that there's a feedback loop going on there. You're getting this information and you're doing something about it. But would you add something more to this description of, of neurobiofeedback that, is, that helps make a graphic picture of it? No, I think Nita gave a great description. I think that, um, you know, it's, it's just maybe worth noting that like the, this technology, it, it has been, um, there's been a lot of study about related technologies and um, it often uses the brain's uh, sort of like natural inclination. So it, you, you might be wondering like how you can train the brain to uh, go for a more positive association or something. Sometimes it might be that you receive a, a reward when you, in your thoughts you perform a, a certain action. So for example, um, the human brain naturally, uh, you know, if, if you see a, a video of someone, you know, shooting hoops, right, and the, basket, the basketball is like gonna go into the hoop, you, you naturally wanna see it sink into the hoop, right, if it's like midair. Um, and so there's ways that, that you know, um, with this technology, they can kind of like reward your brain for performing in the more positive association way that we want it to. For example, by, by giving you little like rewards, like you, you see the, the basket make the hoop or you see the flower bloom or something like that. So hopefully that's like enough to paint somewhat of a picture. Okay. Let, let me add one quick thing, which sure. is important, because you said neurofeedback and biofeedback. This is by contrast to exposure therapy, which is that the way that a person degrades or overcomes the memory is by recalling it in vivid detail over and over again until they, in some ways, um, become more comfortable with the memory itself. So instead of reactivating the literal memory through exposure therapy, which can also be paired with neurofeedback, but that's explicit rather than implicit memory activation, decoded neurofeedback means you don't constantly relive the same memory in order to degrade and essentially erase it. Let's debate. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you for that. I hope sure. that was very helpful for everybody. Um, so, Nita, I, I want to take the, 
the, most of the objections, I think all of the objections from Seagal are essentially philosophical and, um, and, and also with concerns about implications for policy. But, but she made the philosophical argument that if we alter uh, some part of our memory to the point of erasing it, um, that we might be losing some part of ourselves and memories are just built into our senses of ourselves and a sort of implication that, you know, we live in a world now when we don't know, can we trust any piece of information that we see on the internet? Can we trust any image? If we're living in a world where we now know that perhaps what's in our brain is not what used to be there because it got changed, uh, does that, is that un could that be undermining to the sense of self in the way that Seagal is talking about it? So I think Seagal's argument boils down to the idea that there's something core to memory as it happened to us and having to um, relive or experience or integrate it into our sense of self that's critical to human flourishing and human identity. And I want to offer a different perspective on that, which is the process itself of creation of identity whether that's choice about how you want to endure memory or how or whether you want to integrate it into your sense of self and sense of well-being. I'll give you an example. I was, um, so in about a decade ago, I suffered from thyroid cancer. Um, and the question for me at the time was, am I a thyroid cancer survivor? Is that a core part of my identity or is this something really annoying that I have to go through? <laughs> and the way I decided to identify with it was it was super annoying that I had to go through it. The chance of survival was like 95% it was a very annoying surgery. It was frustrating to me, but it was my choice about how I wanted to incorporate it into my own identity. Mm -hmm. Memory, I think of in much the same way, which is the idea that memory is something that happens to you and that there is a single way to process it and to endure it, I think is contrary to what okay. the very core identity of, of agency is. To go? Yeah, I think there are potentially, you know, multiple different ways to process, reprocess, engage with our memories. And I don't believe that there is some magical, you know, memory that is, is like perfectly, uh, you know, always remains the same. Like we know this about like, you know, we know from neuroscience that, you know, we revisit memories, they change somewhat, right? So I don't, I don't want to sort of mystically construct it as something like that. Um, my concern is more what happens when we um, kind of potentially rob ourselves of the ability to tell a cohesive or coherent story or narrative about what has happened to us. Um, I think that the mind abhors a vacuum and it particularly abhors a vacuum of story, of narrative. Um, when we, you know, when we erase something or modify it, I worry that, you know, I, I could imagine for myself, if I were to do this, I, I will obsessively fixate and I will, you know, I could have very easily imagine myself then obsessing about that gap in my, in my memory. And I know it's not literally erasing the semantic content necessarily, but still I think I would find myself wondering, what would I be so, feeling yeah, now if I hadn't we, we We know people who have been, for example, in an accident with, head, with a head injury and they can't remember what happened mm -hmm. and that gap bothers them and they seem to struggle to want to get it back, which, which suggests to me that what Sigal is saying is there is that, that, that having a, the sense of a hole in your memory can be troubling and if this, if this uh, process produces that, that that would be another argument against it. Yeah, I mean, I think if there was literally a discontinuity of self, right? If we're talking about wiping my memory clean, all of my memories clean, so that there's literally like Nita, and then there's Nita Prime, and Nita Prime has no memory of Nita and anything that came before it, there is a true discontinuity of self. Choosing to erase specific memories that are particularly traumatic and ones that are causing enduring suffering that are difficult for you to move past, that to me is a process of creation of identity, of integrating the pieces of your life that you wish to have be part of your core identity and the parts of your life that don't. If the technology gets out of control and suddenly it's literally people getting lobotomized, uh, yeah, I'd sure. be concerned as well. Go ahead. Okay, I, th I didn't know if you wanted to do a follow-up. <laughs> another, another issue that uh, Seagal, and I don't mean to be bringing, I'm going to bring some of your points to Seagal. Oh, it's, it's, fine. But, okay. it's fine. You bring Seagal's points to me. I'm happy that to, suffering to take them on. Suffering, <laughs> suffering serves a constructive purpose, she was arguing. And yeah. 
Um, and you've made the point that it's not necessarily getting rid of the, uh, the, the fact of knowing that something happened, but the, the associations around it that cause pain, which means getting rid of the suffering aspect of it. And Seagal's so saying that suffering is a motivator, suffering is a teacher. Um, suffering should be part of life, suffering has a positive role. And let's not mess with that. Yeah, so I mean, I think terrible things happen to people every day and it's uh, a matter of fate as to which terrible thing happens to you. Um, and the idea that you should have to endure whatever life throws at you and that the only way that you're living an authentic life is by choosing to take whatever fate has thrown at you and incorporating that into your identity as opposed to finding ways to move through it that are healthier for you, um, I think that's a normative judgment about how people yeah. cope. And a perfectly reasonable way to cope from my perspective is to erase and modify a memory. We do get Novocaine at the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and Versed. <laughs> so yeah, so I think there's a, like, there's a really important point to make here and I'm glad we're getting to it. On the one hand, we have this view of, you know, and, and religions and philosophies for all of human history basically have, have talked about how suffering can be ennobling. There can be this benefit that we reap from suffering. It can lead to growth. The, um, Nita and I have talked about this before, but the Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh had this phrase that I like, no mud, no lotus. Meaning, if you don't have the mud of human experience, the suffering, the pain, you're also not gonna grow the beautiful lotus or the, you know, the meaning or whatever. But he also, one time when someone approached him and asked, okay, but how much suffering should we endure? He said, well, not too much, right? And I love that line because I think this, this is a wise balancing of simultaneously recognizing the value that can be derived from suffering, but also, you know, we don't wanna have the hubris of coming to any one individual and saying, I know better than you, you know, I somehow know all of your life circumstances and your temperament and your psychological conditions at this moment. And I, I can tell for sure that if you were to just, you know, tough it out through this suffering, you're gonna have post-traumatic growth and it's gonna be better on the other side, right? Like, we don't want to have that hubris with regards to any one individual. And so that's why I said at the top, I can envision that there would be exceptions to this, right? Where it could be that there are some really severe situations where, you know, maybe, maybe someone needs to undergo this, this process of, of erasure. But I think that the, there, there is so much um, weighing against it that I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want that to be but routine I, in any I, way. I, I think that that sounds like the, the case that Nita is making, not that it should be everybody, but that in certain situations, am I? Well, I, that's right, and I also think that there's a judgment that Seagal is making about, you know, that there are only certain circumstances in which it's permissible, and that you should feel badly about making choices that um, ease your suffering or make choices about self-determination over your own experiences in life. And I don't think that those kinds of normative judgments about how we choose to live our own lives, how much suffering, you know, is enough, uh, who decides how much suffering or which instances of suffering, like only if you have, you know, had a significant loss in your life are you allowed to erase your memory and every other instance will be judged. No, I think actually we should be celebrating cognitive freedom. We should be celebrating people having the ability to make choices and to direct their own mental experiences. I agree that we don't want to come with an attitude of judgment. Um, we don't want to be like moralizing about this and, and judging people who opt to, to use this technology. If someone said to me, Sigal, I just feel like this is the right thing for me, I need to do this, I would approach them with 100% compassion and 0% judgment. At least I hope that would be my attitude. That being said, as much as you know, it's very you know, common and popular in our sort of like liberal world to talk about, and rightly so, you know, the value of like autonomy and individual decision-making and self-determination, and you know best for yourself what's right, yes, but also mm, sometimes you don't have the bird's eye view. Sometimes there's wisdom of you know, long traditions that have come before you or other people that can see something you, you are not seeing. Um, and there, there might be value to, you know, waiting a little bit or trying a different approach um, that, you know, in that moment of, of intense suffering, you, you might not, um, you know, be accessing, but that later on, 
it, it might turn out to be very valuable for you to, to like try for that. I'd like to take this one head on. This gets to Segal's second point about the inability for people to have truly informed consent. And I'll, I'll tell you that this is one that makes me upset in general in life. And the reason it makes me upset is because um, it's this mantra that's really pervasive that experts are in a better position to make choices and that they have the expertise and judgment that you can never individually have to be able to make truly autonomous choices. But who can make a better choice about what's in your own personal self-interest? Who's better aligned with what your values are or what your degree of how much you can handle or how much you want to handle or what you want to integrate into your self-identity than you? I think these literacy uh, tests that people try to put into place as a gateway for people having access to information about themselves or making choices for themselves echo historic types of literacy tests about other people are in a better position to make judgments for what's best for society than you individually. That I, I find troubling. Can I reply to that? You can definitely reply to that. <laughs> so, yeah. yes, I, I want to clarify that I didn't mean, you know, when I, when I said other people might have wisdom around this, whatever, that it's, it might be worth listening to. I don't particularly, you know, or exclusively mean medical experts. What I mean is that I think there's, a, ultimately here like a, a difference in worldviews and a question of what kind of culture we want to create, um, what kind of habits of mind we want to inculcate. So ultimately, I think this, this conversation uh, at the core of it or underlying it is this philosophical question. What is a human life for? Is the purpose of life to, you know, to feel good, meaning you know, have a good time, feel comfortable, feel happy, reduce suffering as much as you can, or is it to make something meaningful? I don't think there's a wrong answer here. I just think that these are different approaches, different worldviews, you could call them. And if you, you know, I, I incline towards the, you know, the view that it's like, let's make something meaningful. And sometimes suffering can actually be conducive to that. Not always, again, there are exceptions where it would be, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, too much, too much suffering. It's gonna bowl you over. You're not gonna be able to get yourself out of that mud. And there, you know, I don't wanna come with the hubris and say, oh, I know better than you, but I just think that we're living in a culture that is so quick to run for the techno fix that we are habitually shortchanging the other propensity. And I just want us to pause a little bit before we run straight to the clinic. I just want us to pause and consider all the other options. I'm troubled by setting a dichotomy between leading a happy life and leading a life of meaning. Um, I think that what is a life of meaning for me and for each of you is something that you are in the best position to choose. That cultivating your own introspection, your mental agility, your relational intelligence with other people, how much suffering you choose to take on, how you integrate that into your own identity, that you're in the best position to make those choices. And so the idea that there is a long tradition, you know, take for example, I've had three children. I had epidurals for two of them. I wish that I had gotten the epidural in time for the third one. That was a kind of suffering that I did not want to endure and that I would happily go back and erase if I could. But that's progress we made in society. The epidural is something that I think eases suffering for people and that by all means, enjoy it. We're gonna, <laughs> in, a, in a couple of minutes, I'd like to come to you for questions and how that will work is if you raise your hands, uh, a microphone will be brought from the back of the room to you and just wait for the mic and then you can ask the question. So I'll come to that in about two or three minutes. But the last piece of this, there are two last pieces that I would like to address from, from your opening statements. Um, Sigal, um, Nita talked about reframing the question as, do I have the right? I'm never a big fan of reframing the question to, to win, but I think, I think it's a relevant part of the discussion that that, 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 is a, that is at stake in this conversation, that should individuals just have that right to make that kind, any kind of choice of that nature themselves? Yeah, so it's a clever reframe. <laughs> it, it takes the debate in a different direction. Right, right, but, right. I, but I want to take it for one question's worth of a reframe. Uh, yeah, so I, I think what, what Nita is really um, strongly advocating for is, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but agency and autonomy and self-determination, right? Is that fair? Um, I would call it self-determination. Self-determination. Yes. Yeah. I think that my broad 
feeling here is, it, and it's very strange for me to be like up here saying this, because I classically think of myself as someone who's very pro-agency autonomy, self-determination, but in the cultural moment where we find ourselves, I think that we are in a culture that pushes so much for mastery and dominion over our human condition, this like urge to control and have power over everything and to make it a la carte and to customize and optimize everything. It actually seems to me to pose a problem for agency. If you end up really going for this, this approach that's about having mastery over everything, are you, if you have mastery over all aspects, are you free to struggle, to make a mistake? It seems like we're almost trying to make the human being perfectible. Um, and then it's not clear to me if you actually, you know, are at that point, you know, free to just be merely human, not this perfect being. If you're not free to make a mistake, if, then I think you don't really have agency to be making real choices. Um, I just want to tell the, our producers, I'm going to go a little bit into the question and answer time to allow Nita to, to answer th that point. Thank you. Um, every person will make a different choice. People already make different choices about how they want to live their lives, what things they choose to remember, how they choose to endure, and how they choose to move through the worst kinds of suffering. I don't think it's seeking perfection. I don't think it is um, trying to create a more perfect existence. What I think it is is trying to live authentically according to your own values, according to what you believe is something that will help you become who you are that is consistent with your own identity. So I, I don't think of it as a techno fix. I think about it as curation of self and curation of your own identity. Okay, I'd like to go to some audience questions now, and uh, I'm going to start on the aisle here. Uh, uh, and again, my, I beg you to, <laughs> to, to ask a question, because if you don't, I'm going to have to pass over you, so go for it. I'm wondering um, at what point, uh, so we're saying um, that this is a technology to help people um, potentially deal with trauma that they've experienced. We already use things like, like heavy medications for that. Um, so would, would you be saying your question is, what's the difference between using a heavy medication and using this technology since we're in, down that road anyway? Exactly. That's how we would ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but thank, you for the, thank you for putting that out there. I think it's a great question. I think it's how it works um, and the precision of it. So. Generally, medications come in different classes. Some of them, for example, are um, like SSRIs, things that generally help you cope and move through a moment. Um, what they do overall, well, we don't have a great sense exactly of what they do, but what we do know is that they tend to blunt emotion more generally to enable people to who are suffering either from depression or acute trauma to be able to move through it without the full force of the emotion. The precision is the difference here, which is looking at a, like a specific trauma or memory, and then rather than dampening your emotional response more generally, being able to retrain that brain activity on positive associations instead that enable you to potentially remember some aspects of it, but have that memory degrade over time. Would you like to take on that question? Oh, that's beautiful. That's great. Uh, on the far side, uh, yes. I'm the, uh, just wait for the mic, please. Thanks. There you go, thank you. At what point is it optimal to erase the memory? Like if it's a week later or a year later, that person still has the opportunity to grow from the experience even five years later. So at what point would you say is optimal should the person decide to or not to erase the memory and what would be your argument time-wise? That is a really well phrased question and right to the point. Would you, who would like to take that? Do you want to take oh, that first? To you, I, think. I guess it's to you're, me. You're, but you're not. Go ahead not, and then yeah. I'll. I'll okay. I mean, yeah. I, I think it's a choice. Like for me personally, when I've used different technologies and techniques to try to intervene on my own memories, it's when I've gotten to the point where I can't move through it otherwise, that I've tried other traditional approaches to doing so, and that I need help to be able to move through those memories in a more precise or um, a more powerful way than I've otherwise been able to do so. I think that is up to the individual. How much suffering do they want to endure, and how much can they endure? Yeah, I think that makes good sense. I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, there might be this tendency to say, um, you know, I brought up earlier the example of, you know, um, school shootings or 
Also comes to mind for me um, as a journalist, other stories I've reported on, like I was covering the um, sex abuse scandal in the Catholic Church, for example. Now, you never want to, you know, you, you talk to survivors and just it's heartbreaking. And you never want to go to any one individual and say, you, you should just like hang on to this memory and keep it as crystal clear and sharp in your mind as possible because maybe in 10 years you're going to bring a class action lawsuit with 12 other survivors, <laughs> right? You, you don't want to, you know, I, I do agree with Nita that there is an element here of like, you don't want to presume to, you know, say to any one individual, I know all of your psychological circumstances better than you, better than anyone else, right? At the same time, right, there is, there is this, um, like, there is this reality that um, sometimes when people do feel that they are willing and able to hang on to certain memories, they are then, you know, a benefit of that societally is that they are then able to maybe bring someone to justice, maybe prevent a certain priest from being able to abuse anybody else in the future. I also, um, I think about, you know, other horrible traumas uh, in history. I think about the Holocaust, right? And survivors I know personally who remembered that, that trauma of being in a concentration camp the rest of their lives. There is a, a gift that they then give to society of being able to, you know, advocate against any kind of genocide like this ever occurring in the future. Again, I don't want to come to any individual survivor and say, I know better than you, okay, you so are able to tolerate I'm, this. I'm gonna, but, I'm gonna move on then to, yeah. uh, this in the third row, uh, Jen, if you could stand up. Uh, in the mics to your left, sir. Can uh, decoding neurofeedback be used to remove religiosity? I, by that I mean, you know, some nonsensical ideas that has gone through your head, to your head since childhood. So, but you know intellectually they're not meaningful, but you know, don't eat this, don't So it's sort of what else can uh, decoded neuro, uh, yeah. biofeedback, decoded neurofeedback get at? Three and, times, four times. Yeah. <laughs> I should have been four. What else can it get at? And I think, I'm wondering if you're asking is, if there's a concern about that. Well, uh, there, I mean, I, it sounds like can, you, can it be used for other purposes? And the answer is yes. It isn't just painful and traumatic memories. It's any memory. What you're talking about is more of a pattern of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be harder to trace every neural pathway that is activated as you have a, particularly pat, like a particular pattern um, that's been inculcated in you over time. Uh, so it'd be harder to do, but you know, specific memories are, are far easier at this stage, I think, using decoded neurofeedback. Is it impossible to imagine a future in which that could be possible? Maybe. Right. Does anybody have a question that relates to kind of the policy implications of yeah. the... Yes? Uh, wait for the mic, please. Thanks. It's just coming <laughs> to your right. Very short question. How do we know when enough is enough? Can you be, in this case, I do need some more detail. <laughs> what, I think, when, I, I, mean, un, I think enough, of, enough of what is enough? Enough of this. Of uh, the treatment? Yeah, of this treatment. Same uh, as we, with medication. Okay. We still don't know. What's the dosage? Enough. What's the yeah. dosage? Mm. Got it. And is, and, is, yeah. and is that a concern of yours, too? Because I mean, I think I, it's I, when you can endure. I, right. I mean, presumably, presumably it would be until the person, the individual, is satisfied that their, their levels of suffering are tolerable. Or they feel that they've forgotten, or that it isn't, uh, it, you know, they're not in echoes of PTSD, that they're able to sleep at night, that they're able to close their eyes and not be back in the moment. So you don't believe that's related? Uh, we, we can't hear you without the microphone. And I'm going to let you have a follow-up, because I'm not sure that you unloaded your full ammunition uh, of questions. No, because coming back to the Holocaust, uh, Viktor Frankl said... I can't, I, we, we, gotta, we need questions, sorry. I, I'm gonna have to Okay. No, no, I'm, I'm gonna move on, because you had a question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks though. And, and I, we're we'll starting to question. get into the news you can use to understand the technology. We really wanna keep, the, uh, keep the, on the issues that, are, that the two debaters disagree about. Okay, my question is going to use two examples, each one said by each of the debaters. You mentioned that you had a third child and you didn't have epidural, didn't have time to have epidural, and you, sh and you wish you could forget that pain. You wouldn't forget that you had a kid, you forget the pain. You mentioned the Holocaust. I'm a Holocaust, I'm, I'm a son of a Holocaust survivor and grandson of su uh, survivors. Can you imagine the trauma of their lives and consequently my life? 
So my question is, because I know we're impatient for a question, my question is, what's the margin of error? So I want to raise the fact that I... Okay, no, what's the margin of error? And, and if you could just have asked that without... I, we, we just don't have time for everybody's, for, for everybody's question. Uh, right in the front row here. And a mic's coming from the left. Do we have a place in this conversation for normal processes of filtering and forgetting, such as meditation or um, religious precepts that are always spinning it to the positive, such as forgiveness? So your question would be, would those be better alternatives, I think? Would, would Seagal think that those are better alternatives? How do we include those processes in this dialogue? Thank so you. I, that, th your last articulation I love, right? I don't want to say, oh, I, I can make a blanket statement for every individual in every circumstance, this is better than that, than that right? But exactly how you phrased it in your last question is, is what I'm trying to get across. How can we make space to include just considering these other options fully, giving them a full chance in a marketplace of ideas and in a culture that right now privileges, I think, the alternative? Why do you think that? I mean, why, why do you think that this technology would crowd out the other options? I think, and, and, I see and, and why that. isn't it included, by the way, on the question of should we erase memories, it wasn't should we erase memories using decoded neurofeedback, it's should we erase memories, and each of these are different processes and techniques to be able to do so. Hmm. Sorry, well, you well I mean, so, saying so, what's so the point is these are, these are memory whether it's meditation techniques. or yeah. whether it's you know, uh, using exposure therapy, each of these are techniques to try to erase memories. And so what is it about the decoded neurofeedback that you've singled out, and is that really so different in the broader debate question of should we erase memories? To me, it seems like there's some qualitative difference between erasing, and I know it's not erasing in a sort of like lay sense, but th what this technology seems like it would do versus um, a reprocessing that might be a little bit more slow, potentially more, uh, you know, um, have a little bit of more room for like meaning making and growth to emerge from the process of like working through what your narrative is. Um, I don't know, but meditation doesn't strike me as erasing memories. I don't know that I would group it in there. Um, but I don't know if maybe you want to talk about something like EMDR. I, I want to move on to another question. The very back corner of the room. Hi, thank you. I do want, I want to go back to this question of intergenerational trauma, and I'd be very interested in how you think this technology can impact intergenerational trauma that, as we know, obviously has cyclical patterns that can go down family member to family member. We, I think most of the conversation has been about individual impact. If you could address that. I, I, again, we're, I'm not trying to look at how the technology will work, but, but what are the benefits, and do you have a way to phrase that? Yes. What would be the benefits or lack thereof <laughs> of this technology to address intergenerational trauma? Nice try. Uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it works. I, I, I think I would want to go to Seagal if, 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 if a case could be made, mm -hmm. a broader use case, would that loosen your objections at all? I think it sort of folds under in the, in the same rubric of what we've been talking about. I, th I think it's a great question. I'm glad you asked that because um, that's such an important issue. I think that, you know, intergenerational trauma, there's, there, there can be different ways of working through it. Now, again, there might be some scenarios where this, I don't know, this might be the most effective way. I would have questions around, you know, many of us have probably heard the expression at this point, the body keeps the score, right? Different ways that trauma registers in the body and it's not just something in your, in your mind, right? So I would have questions about like, also epigenetics, right? I would have questions about like what aspects of trauma are gonna be passed down, um, you know, regardless of, of this sort of erasure. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think that um, there's other ways of processing trauma that also could be worth exploring that could prevent the passing down to further generations. So we're gonna have, I think, time for one more question, but I do wanna bring up a question that hasn't come up yet that came from Segal's argument that we could be moving into a world where the doctor says to you, you know what, J just go get the thing erased. I don't have time to do, go through all of this therapy and everything else, that it becomes a very, very easy choice, that that would be a scary world to live in. 
And if you ha can answer that in 45 seconds, I can get another question in. <laughs> yeah, I actually wrote an article called The Cost of Changing Our Minds and worried about the possibility in the tort system that requires, for example, reasonable mitigation of your own injuries, that we could come to a place where we believe reasonable mitigation of your injuries includes, it, includes the requirement to address your psychological trauma through um, erasing or changing your memories. Um, to me, the right to cognitive liberty safeguards against that, because the right to cognitive liberty is the right to self-determination over brains and mental experiences, which means that couldn't be a condition of participation in society. It's a broad right to and a right from interference with our minds. This is going to be the uh, last question. Uh, and I, Leah, can you just hand that to me? I can't, I can't see if you could just hand it to me. Thanks. Thank you for your time. Uh, many new technologies that come out have negative externalities associated with them. I'm curious how both of your points of view would address the negative externalities that are possible with this technology. Yeah, I'm happy to take that on sure. first. So, you know, one of the things that Seagal said was it's hard to have fully informed consent consistent with your question of we don't always know what the negative externalities of technologies can be. That's true of many choices that we make in life, which is we go into those choices without full information. We have to do the best that we can with the information that we have available to us to make what is never truly fully informed consent to anything because we can't know how anything will return out. We nevertheless make choices all the time in the face of uncertainty, and that is part of the process of growth and transcendence, is learning based on the different pieces of information you have available, what choices will you make? I think that's just part of it, is uncertainty is baked in, and every person will make different choices based on that uncertainty. Sigal, do you see regulation for this? Do you see government regulation for this? Do you see the government making decisions about this question? Do I think that would happen if this technology you rolls out? Do you think that should happen? Yeah, I mean, I think we have regulations for all sorts of things in the medical and psychological sphere, so I don't see why this would be any different. But I, when I talk about implicit coercion and what if society you know, wants to just send you to the clinic, I don't just talk about what would be happening from you know, bureaucratic you know, government stuff or regulations. I'm talking about what, what your best friend says. Are they willing to like, patiently listen to you for hours? Or do they impatiently sort of say, uh, go, you know, go resolve it over there at the clinic? And your thought on government having a role? I think we know clearly that you would I think you, you know clearly my view on that, which is <laughs> that should not be uh, a decision that is being put into the hands of like, there shouldn't be an indication, which is only if you qualify for this degree of suffering or this kind of loss or this kind of trauma can you have access to this technology. That to me seems like a disaster in the making. All right, I want to thank everybody for your questions. We have a hard, oh, thanks for the round of applause. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, unfortunately, because they need the room next, that's why I'm pressing mm -hmm. so much to get us wrapped up for time. Thanks for that. Um, we, we're going to go to our closing round now. And in our closing round, uh, each of the debaters has two minutes each to make their final uh, uh, argument for uh, yes or no. And Seagal, since Nita went first for the opening, you have the floor. Sure. Tell us one more time why we should not erase bad memories. So. I want to briefly tell you the story of Jane McGonigal, a woman that I had the pleasure of interviewing um, a couple years ago. Jane, about a dozen years ago, suffered a terrible concussion. And as a result, she was in bed basically for months with just terrible anxiety, vertigo, nausea, pain, you name it, to the point that um, she became suicidal. Jane had something going for her, though, which is that she's a professional game designer. She said to herself in that moment, I'm either going to kill myself or I'm going to turn this into a game. She ended up turning it into a game, meaning she figured out things that would help her potentially feel better. And so things like um, drink a glass of water, go for a walk around the block, talk to a friend. She al whenever she did one of these, she gave herself points. She called it a power up, right? She, she talked about unlocking achievements. She framed it for herself in, in the terms of a game. This helped her a lot. Um, and it helped her so much that she actually ended up turning it into an app called Super Better that you can download if you want. Um, and it helps people. It's helped a million people with depression, anxiety, and other issues. Now, if you talk to Jane, she says, I'm really glad that I had that concussion and that experience of suffering 10 years ago. 
Uh, not only I came out of it super better, stronger than before, experienced post-traumatic growth, but also was able to help all these other people. Not everyone is Jane should be expected to, you know, make it out in the same way and put out an app and etc. But I want to preserve the option for that kind of, you know, in allowing ourselves to pause to envision that type of potential future path for ourselves when we're in a moment of deep suffering. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Before Nita's closing, I just want to ask you to resist the temptation after she finishes to bolt, because I, I want to ask you all something. It's a very simple question. If you could just stay for that 45 seconds afterwards, I'd appreciate it. Nita, the floor is yours for your closing statement, and you're answering yes to the question. Oh, I am. Oh, good. <laughs> Better shift my, yeah, my, my answer. All right. Each of us has a personal journey through grief. I want to tell you about mine, where I used the power of neurofeedback um, and a psychologist to be able to move through the greatest trauma in my life. On Mother's Day in 2017, after 10 weeks of prolonged hospitalization, we lost our daughter, Callista, to a respiratory virus and the complications that followed from it. In the weeks and months and years that followed, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't close my eyes without reliving every moment of the trauma in the hospital. It got to the point where I couldn't parent effectively our third child who came after her, that I reacted in terror that I was not myself, that I couldn't be present in the moment. I tried traditional approaches and it didn't work for me. Each of us is a mosaic of memories. Each of us makes choices about how we will navigate through them. While I don't have an app that I created as a result of moving through that trauma, I do have a platform to argue that each of us has a right to cognitive liberty, a right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences to make choices about how we move through that trauma, how we choose to incorporate our everyday experiences, the worst that can befall us, the arbitrary cruelties of fate, and choose whether or not we endure those or make choices to erase and change them. I didn't betray my memory of Callista by choosing to erase the most painful aspects of it. Instead, I endured to be here today to argue for you that you have a right to erase your memories if you choose to do so. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that concludes the argument argumentation portion of the program, and I just want to say that, as I said at the beginning, what we aim to show with Open to Debate is that people can disagree robustly and honestly and respectfully without having to be, see each other as enemies. I think that was so well demonstrated by the two of you in the way that you did this. I really want to thank you very much for that. Um, and and every, everybody who got up to ask a question, I appreciate it, including the questions that I had to pass on because I wanted to bring things back to the focus of the debate. I know it's so tempting to try to understand more about this. So thank you for accommodating me and in, in, in my moving on for the questions. I just want to know I respect all of you for having the guts to stand up and ask a question in the first place, and I appreciate it. Um, I just want to let you know about us a little bit more. Uh, we've been doing this since 2006. We're a nonprofit. You can see what we're trying to do in the culture. If you would like to support us, that's how we survive. You can go to our website, opentodebate.org. Um, and the last thing I want to say, that we like to find out how we did in terms of your listening. And a very simple question by a round of applause. We would, I'm going to have a second follow-up question, but the first question, by round of applause, how many of you changed your minds from yes to no or no to yes on this question today? And then just more broadly, how many of you come away from this conversation, this debate, such that you're going to think differently about it just because of what you heard here today, regardless of what's going on? So um, that, that delights us. Um, <laughs> it means that you were listening closely. That's the point we're trying to do here at Open to Debate. So thanks, all of you, for being open to debate. I'm John Donvan, and we will see you next time. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that was very it. brave. Thank you, everybody, for tuning into this episode of Open to Debate. You know, as a nonprofit, 
Our work to combat extreme polarization through civil and respectful debate is generously funded by listeners like you, by the Rosencrantz Foundation, and by supporters of Open to Debate. Open to Debate is also made possible by a generous grant from the Laura and Gary Lauder Venture Philanthropy Fund. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman, Clea Connor is CEO, Leah Mathau is our chief content officer, Marlette Sandoval is our producer, Gabriella Mayer is our editorial and research manager, Gabriella Yanicelli is our social media and digital platforms coordinator, Andrew Lipson is head of production, Max Fulton is our production coordinator, Damon Whittemore is our engineer, Rachel Kemp is our chief of staff, Raven Baker is events and operations manager, and I'm your host, John Donvan, we'll see you next time.